Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. Back in Redmond, Washington, we will be doing a sector deep dive into the technology sector, one of the leading sectors. We're going to break down the group themes underneath that sector leadership. I'm going to share with you one of my breadth chart lists in today's chart list segment, uh, where I'm going to share with you the way that I like to uh, understand breadth, the uh, part of my weekly uh, chart routine. And we're going to recap today's uh, trading, obviously a nice follow through from, uh, from last week giving some encouraging signs leading into uh, into the uh, year end. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Good to be back in the studio. We were uh, out last week on the road recording and broadcasting live from New York City. Had an unforgettable week of interviews uh, with some fantastic analysts, strategists, market experts. Also had a, a wonderful day on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, meeting with Jay Woods, one of the executive floor governors. Uh, learning a lot about his role, how the role of the market maker has evolved, thinking about the anatomy of a trade and how it evolves, how the IPO process plays out on the floor. Some really cool content that we're excited to share with you in the coming weeks and, uh, and months based on those, uh, on those discussions. You know, nice rally today. So it's a follow through day to the upside. You know, last week we were looking a lot about the seasonal trends leading into year end. Is this the time when we see the traditional leadership of, uh, of, uh, of sort of the risk on trade leading into uh, into January, that Santa Claus rally, and boy, today so far appears that we've started along those way, uh, along that path. So we're going to break down some of the price action. Before I get to that, though, I did want to share with you. Um, I'm going to be speaking at an event tomorrow morning. It's at 11 o'clock Eastern. It's part of the Market Vision 2020 uh, webinar event that's coming up in January. Each of the speakers, myself included, we're going to be sharing a, uh, a brief event leading up to that. Mine is tomorrow at 11 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Pacific, called Better Routines Mean Better Decisions. So those of you that are watchers of the show that see how I set up my stock charts account, how I go through chart lists, I'm basically going to focus on that for now, really talk about the importance of daily and weekly routines in your process. So um, if it's something that's of interest to you, I encourage you to check out my blog, The Mindful Investor. I'm going to put out a story soon after the show's over today with a link to the Zoom room you need to go to to, uh, to uh, participate in that webinar event tomorrow, uh, 11 o'clock Eastern. Hope you can join me there. So let's talk about a market recap for today. Uh, you know, obviously the big question right now, does the market follow the traditional seasonal tendencies? And we are in the seasonally strongest part of the year, November through April, and then we have May through October is the seasonally weaker part of the year. So now we're in the time when it tends to be more of a risk on environment, when stocks tend to rally, you tend to see outperformance, especially from groups that have done well up until this point, because that's where people are going to want to rotate. So money managers that have not been in some of these winning stocks like Microsoft and Apple and others are almost forced to go there. We call it window dressing. So they take some of the risk off. Anything, any losing positions, you get out of them, make your portfolio look about as good as you can. And that usually tends to lift things unless there is something different. And, and December is not always an up month, even though it usually is. So the question now is, do we follow those seasonal tendencies? And, and you know, so far, Today certainly seems to follow through with what we saw last week, which was a nice rally on Thursday and Friday. So here we're looking at the daily chart of the S&P. Here's Thursday's nice rally, uh, Friday's sort of sideways move, sort of choppy, and then today's follow through to the upside. And again, there are a lot of macro drivers talking about U.S.-China trade negotiations and, and so forth. I don't want to get too much into those details. I'd rather focus on the charts and how people are reacting to all those macro themes that I'm sure you were reading about uh, outside of the, the 30 minutes we spend together every afternoon. So regardless of those headlines, the trend remains positive. And I can say that not by opinion, but by fact. The trend up until this moment has been strong. And I do that by measuring the high prices, the peaks in the price, and the lows. We had a lower low at the beginning of December, a bit of a swing 
below the previous low, which is sort of unusual, but now we have resolved back to the upside and overall trend remains positive. Noteworthy based on today's rally, the RSI is again overbought the daily RSI. And again, that doesn't <clears throat> on its own mean that, uh, that we should be pulling back. All that means is the price has gone up a lot recently. But overall, if you look, more often than not, looking back at the left side of the chart, this is back in June and July, every time the RSI becomes overbought, we tend to pull back just a little bit because there's a little, you know, it, it's, it's gone so far so quick, you'd expect a little bit of a right sizing back down to the, uh, the longer trend. So overall, certainly feeling a little extended. We talked last week about the distance from the 200-day moving average, and that's certainly become a little more exaggerated with today's rally. So usually when we get this extended, you would expect a little bit of a pullback. But again, overall, the trend remains certainly positive. Today's trading, what was interesting, if you look at the MACD or the PPO at the bottom here, you can see how the day, uh, the day played out. The first hour was sort of long and strong, the big gap higher from Friday's close. Nice continued rally. You can see the MACD indicator, very positive. It crossed over around 1030, 10.45, <coughs> excuse me, and from then on out, sort of more of a downtrend. You can see the MACD sort of sloping downwards, and that's just recognizing the fact that the short-term trend is reversed, and it sort of remained in that mode into the close. And again, that last 30 minutes, last hour is usually a good indication of big institutional movements, certainly more profit-taking than new buying going into the, uh, into the end there. I want to look at our members dashboard. Let's break down some of the other themes here. So large caps, the S&P 500 up 70 basis points. The NASDAQ, the tech heavy NASDAQ up a little more, up 0.9%. We're going to talk about technology later in our sector deep dive segment. We'll think about some of the themes that are probably driving that. Noticeably, the uh, mid cap stocks uh, up about the same as the S&P, just a 0.7%, but small caps lagging a little bit. So not as much of a, of a rotation into the real risk on uh, trade in small caps, but uh, overall still, uh, still just fine. At the sector level, we had energy, utilities, healthcare, the top three sectors. So interesting on a big up day, you had energy, which isn't surprising, that sort of traditional late cycle leadership, uh, but utilities is certainly a little more of a head scratcher, being the second highest sector on a day when the market was really in, in rally mode. Um, so an interesting theme there to sort of, uh, to sort of think about. Industrials, which are usually part of the trade that would be up here along with materials and energy, sort of at the bottom of the list, flat for the day on a, on a pretty strong update. Then we had consumer staples and financials. So a bit of a mixed bag with sectors. Um, you know, when you think of the market being higher, you have a traditional sort of sense of what should be leadership, what would be lagging. We certainly didn't see that today. It's a little more of a mixed uh, a mixed bag of things. And, and in my opinion, what that does is it speaks to the importance of stock work and individual stock work. Don't just think because the market is doing one thing that sectors or industries should be doing something because of that. Nothing, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. There are a lot of potential drivers uh, up and down. So make sure you're thinking about that uh, for sure. Looking at the scooter rankings, some of the stocks that have moved uh, one way or the other, it's noteworthy that um, uh, things like Delta Airlines up at the uh, one of the top 10 movers on the scooter rankings. So airlines have been part of that transport trade which has looked a little weaker, you know, fast forwarding a little foreshadowing to our three and three. One of them is looking at uh, Dow theory and just how that, uh, that relationship between industrials and transports had become disconnected, now just starting to look a little more positive. And I think some of the airlines rotating higher like this certainly are part of that. So Delta just on a couple days now, breaking above uh, to a new uh, two-month closing high, testing resistance here around 58.50, a breakthrough there, starting to change the character of this chart a little bit, showing a little more accumulation, establishing more of a higher low, not yet overbought, so potentially some more upside in some of the airlines. There's some interesting charts maybe to, uh, to consider on there. You also have some energy names like uh, Hess, and, and I would tell you, charts like Hess are very sneaky because they will start looking good and they will look really, really good, and then they will finally hit your radar because we're so used to ignoring energy. So I can't tell you enough, keep your eye on some of these energy names that have been so out of favor because I tell you, when they start to improve, if and when, uh, a lot of people will be caught not there, and, and that's going uh, to be a little bit of a challenge. On the downside, looking at stocks that are down the most, the number one loser on the, uh, on the scooter rank is in the type of proprietary technical ranking is Newell Brands and Consumer Discretionary. So interesting, you have Consumer Name being the top, uh, you know, the weakest stock of the, uh, of the large cap universe, down over 4%, you know, break below support. And again, a lot of people will ask me, we have so many charts that look so good, and it's so easy to find stocks that are going up to the right. What does more of a distributive chart look like? 
I would say something like this, right? Something that's breaking below the 50-day moving average after a nice run. Something that's going below support. So here's a clear support level around 1850 been tested in a number of times in the last two months, now confirmed with a close below it. So on a, any sort of breakdown day, I would always caution you, you want to wait for tomorrow and see what sort of follow through you have. I always, I always say you want a follow through day or some sort of confirmation of the breakdown. So you would want a lower close, some sort of follow through, some sort of continued distribution telling you there's, there's weakness. On a chart like NWL, it's interesting to note also the RSI is just above 40. In a bullish phase, that's where uh, stocks tend to pull back to before they resolve to the upside. So interesting potential change of character with a uh, chart like uh, like Newell Brands. Again, that is a quick run through the market recap. So many other things we could talk about with each of these little pockets of charts that we uh, that we went through. But I would like to move on to our next segment, which is our sector. in terms of what's causing some of these movements. And, and, and I would say from working with a lot of investors, a lot of financial advisors, even a lot of institutional uh, investors, you get so caught up in the top down, here's what the market is doing in the form of the S&P 500. Here's what the sectors are doing. Here's what sectors I would expect to work. And then you're kind of finished. You kind of, you kind of go on to something else when I think you're missing some potential signal from looking one layer down and seeing what's driving some of those movements on the, on the sector charts. So I wanted to start actually by just showing the, um, the uh, technology sector in particular. We're going to deep dive into technology. So we're going to look at the chart of the XLK. You know, there's no denying that this has been leadership in the markets. Um, I can tell that for a number of reasons. Number one, the fact that the price is going up and it's above two upward sloping moving averages. That is the definition of a strong chart, an uptrend up and to the right. Continuing to make new highs last week. Again, so far, you know, this week certainly an intraday uh, high and, and so far a new closing high. The relative performance, I think, really tells the story. So the market bottomed out here uh, last week in December, there was that Christmas Eve low. Technology rallied into the end of the year along with uh, most other things. But look at the relative performance picture from January to where we're at now. Um, the stock's up about 16% on a relative basis um, from, the beginning of, uh, from the beginning of the year. And that's, that's pretty significant. That's on a relative basis. That's outperforming uh, the S&P 500, which is a pretty, pretty big performance uh, a measurement. <clears throat> and you can see this continued pattern of appreciation where the relative strength would pull back but then continue to resolve higher. And we've seen that going into the end of the year. So the question has been, do we see continued leadership from technology? And so far, the answer to that question, you know, in mid-December has been absolutely. Um, so let's dig a little bit below the surface there, see how technology relates to some other sectors, and they'll go, go through some of the industry and stock themes underneath there. So tech at this point, based on our weekly measure of, uh, of all the, uh, of the 11 sectors has been the strongest uh, uh, sector. So here it is on the far right side of the picture. You can see a lot of these defensive sectors like utilities, real estate, consumer staples rotating down and to the left. Some of, uh, some of the sectors like technology, financials, really completing a transition to being in that leading quadrant, really leading, uh, leading the way higher. And I think that is a really important theme that we've been tracking. There, there was the leadership from defensive earlier in the year, which didn't make sense to a lot of investors. This is now making a lot more sense. Now, that was certainly a yield play, a move towards income and the dividend component of utes and real estate. But at this point, it's sort of normalized. It's gone back to where what we would expect with leadership from things like tech and financials, which is really more of a risk on sort of environment. A little bit of a dip down in the last week, but again, that's one, uh, that's one, uh, that's one component. So what is actually making up that chart of technology? The chart's a little smaller here, but I wanted to show the titles here because I think it's usually uh, pretty helpful to, uh, to do that. So these are the groups within. These are the industries that make up the technology sector and how they are rotating around the S&P 500. So here we have the XLK kind of showing you where it's at. And then you can see that some of the groups are actually aggressively, you know, strong, strong performers. And it's things like cons uh, computer hardware, semiconductors. These have been the top uh, sectors on a relative basis than electronic equipment. Down at the bottom, <clears throat> so again, in a very strong sector, you also have some groups that are a little underwhelming. So things like telecom equipment, also things like computer services. So even though the whole sector as a whole overall is doing very, very well on a relative basis, some of the groups are really driving that outperformance. Some of them are driving or, or, or being a weight on that outperformance. 
Now, the reason why the XLK overall is up pretty good is because a lot of the largest names in the sector are up here in these, in these groups. So in hardware, in semiconductors, and hardware, things like Apple and, and stuff that are really going to drive the sector. So if they are in a, in a positive mode, the entire XLK is going to follow the market cap, the weighting of those biggest names. But I wanted to show you that even within a strong sector, there are plenty of opportunities to underweight. So if you're thinking more of, you know, sort of a pairs trade of the strongest and weakest names with weakest names within a sector, there is plenty of opportunity, even in something like tech, which is up big as a, as a whole. Here's the technology sector, and we're going to look at look at it by scooter rankings, similar to the chart we saw before. This is just in a tabular format. It's a little easier sometimes to, to make sense of it. So here we have computer hardware, semiconductors, at the bottom, computer services, telecom equipment. Let's go through each one of those and start to think about um, the names that make it up. So first, if I just look at a uh, preview of the chart here, here we go. And if you move the mouse over the ticker, it gives you a little bit of the preview. You can see how computer hardware has been on an absolute tear. And if you look at a chart of it, you know, new highs again uh, over the last couple weeks. You can see the relative performance up very consistently. So in the last 12 months, this group uh, of computer hardware is up on a relative basis, almost 30%. It's outperformed the S&P 500 by almost 30%. So the group individually has been fantastic. It's overbought right now, and this is one of the things that I've seen on the chart of Apple, a number of names in the space. You have a higher high in price, but at this point, if we pull back a little bit, you'd have a huge RSI bearish divergence of higher highs in price, lower highs in the RSI. It is not confirmed yet because the trend is not over. As of today, we're going higher again, but it's, it's certainly something on my list of things to pay attention to, to see if we get some sort of divergence there, because that would tell you very, very much a different picture. But let's look at the hardware names. Once you bring up the group, click on the scooter column. This is what I tend to do. Now you're sorting it by, uh, that, by that technical rating. So it's the strongest names in the large cap space, mid cap and small cap. Now this is all commingled. So you'll see here, this is a mid cap name at the top. It's an ADR for sharp. You can see a small cap name, Synaptics. And again, what's funny about these uh, rankings, some of these stocks you may not be as familiar with, it's a great way to surface ideas you wouldn't normally see in your screening process or in your normal chart review process. So some interesting ideas, but Apple, Western Digital, let's look at those individually. These are pretty strong charts. Apple looks very much like that index of computer hardware, and you can see the similar pattern, higher highs in price, a potential bearish divergence. We'll have to see if that follows through, but at this point, sort of on my, on my mental watch list, Apple's up on a relative basis 37% in the last year, which is you know, obviously a pretty big number, and especially for a big benchmark name. So the problem at this part of the year is if you've missed out on that, you have to be there just to demonstrate to clients that you've owned Apple. Um, Western Digital is actually one of the strongest uh, ratings, even though the chart has improved dramatically. So it was breaking to new lows not too long ago. I thought it was really interesting at the time. We had this sort of uh, hammer candle, and you think of it as something, the open and closer at the top. You have a long lower shadow or lower stem. Think of it as hammering out a bottom. We rallied right off of the hammer candle at support, broke above the most recent swing high, broke back above the 200-day moving average. Now we've really followed through, and the last week has been pretty strong, not yet overbought, but at this point, you have the opposite. You have more of a distributive uh, candle uh, at, the, uh, at the top here, a shooting star candle. So suggest maybe a little bit of short-term weakness, but on a relative basis, certainly has improved uh, dramatically. The next group I want to look at down at technology, we sort by scooter ranking, and we go to semiconductors. So this is a group we've talked about a great deal because it's such a great leading indicator for the market as a whole. When this basket of stocks is doing well, the market as a whole tends to do very well. We don't have a time to go through a lot of these names, but as I move my mouse over the tickers, you can see how a chart like Skyworks has been just fantastic on a relative basis, dramatic outperformance. And the leadership, you can see all the large cap names up at the top here. The leadership in the names like Micron, like AMD, like Skyworks has really been another indication of strength in technology. And also, I would say overall, a good indication for strength of the markets as a whole. I do want to wrap up this deep dive by reminding you that even in a sector with so much leadership, with so many strong names, we didn't even get to software, there's some beautiful charts in there, there are charts that are not that good. So if you go into computer services, you go into telecom equipment, we'll pick computer services here just very briefly, um, you will see there are some stocks like CDW, which are holding up very well. This almost looks like uh, a semiconductor stock, just the, the characteristics of the price. But if you look down at the bottom of it, you can see there are some names like Cognizant Technology, 
looking totally out of character relative to the other uh, uh, stocks in the, uh, in the technology sector. VeriSign's another one that's just been such a relative weaker name, even though the price hasn't broken down a ton in the last couple months on a relative basis, you've got absolutely killed. So some really interesting charts in technology. Again, my, my goal was to demonstrate what I hope you got out of it is at a high level, tech has been a fantastic place to be on an absolute and a relative basis. There are a lot of themes deeper down, a lot of stocks that look very good, but also some opportunities either to underweight or for look, some, uh, look for some chances to, uh, to take profits on names that are not uh, leading as, uh, as much. That was our deep dive into the, uh, into the technology sector. Excuse me, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be back. I want to share with you one of my favorite chart lists for analyzing market breadth. You're not going to want to miss it. So we'll be back in one minute. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show, The Final Bar. Thanks for joining us every weekday uh, to wrap up today's price action connected to the long-term trends. Let's move right on to our next segment, which is called Today's Chart List. Um, you know, talking to some of my fellow uh, stock charts uh, colleagues, we were talking about what to do with, uh, with a show like The Final Bar, and we realized sharing some of the ways that we use the platform is probably one of the, the ways we can add the most value to you. And I know guys like Tom Boley and others have done so well, Arthur Hill, Greg Schnell, at demonstrating some of the ways they use stock charts. My contribution to that is to share how I use, how I have some of my chart lists set up, and what sort of lessons I learned from them. I wanted to share with you the chart lists I use to measure breadth. And again, if you're not familiar with the chart list platform on your member dashboard, click on chart lists. You probably don't have a lot of these on here. If you haven't used it, you can click on new to start creating them. I'm going to show you one of my breadth chart lists, this one down here called breadth indicators. I'm going to show it to you up here because, as you can see, I tend to have this one open all the time. Part of my weekly routine is going through this list of breadth indicators. I also have one for sentiment. I also have one for ratios. And those three chart lists have been some of the ones where I, I feel like over time I've in incrementally improved them the most because I keep finding... Uh, charts that other speakers, that other presenters, other TV hosts are using, and I always save them onto my chart list, and so I'd encourage you to, to do the same. If you have none of these charts, create a blank chart list called Breadth Indicators. Any of the ones that you see that I use that you think are interesting, create them on your own login, and you can put them right on your list, and over time, keep adding the charts that you find in an article or that you see someone sharing, and, uh, and keep building up your own, build up your own list of charts. So the way that I tend to use is, I tend to look at this actually just on this 10 per page view, just to look at the them all in order because for me I start at the top I go right through the list and it's a great way to understand uh, market breadth so I'm going to go through each one of them in rapid fire succession so the first two are looking at the percent of stocks above the 200 day and above the 50 day moving averages these are my favorite way to measure market breadth I've been looking at it for years and so the way I have these charts set up this is looking at the last five years and here I'm looking at the percent of NYSE names so it's a broad universe of the New York Stock Exchange, the percent above the 200-day moving average. Here we have the percent of S&P 500 stocks above their 200-day. The next chart, I just look at the S&P and it's the percent above the 200-day, the percent above the 50-day. The reason why this is so helpful is the S&P 500 is a cap-weighted index, meaning the largest stocks by market cap have an outsized weight in the index. So stocks like Apple, Facebook, ExxonMobil, names that you know and, and are aware of, those movements will drive the movement in the index very significantly because there's such a big market cap. The percent of stocks above the 200-day, above the 50-day are equal weighted measures. It's just counting the number of stocks. So it's a great way to measure the performance of the entire cap-weighted index to the individual stocks that make up that index. How many uh, stocks are participating in that uptrend? <clears throat> Overall, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, uh, positive here. You have over 75%, over three in four of S&P names, names are above their 200-day moving average, about the same above the 50-day. Overall, fairly constructive at this point. Next, I'm looking at the percent of stocks that are advancing or declining relative to the total. So here I'm looking at the percent of uh, stocks on the New York Stock Exchange that are up on the day, the percent that are down on the day. And I just show it as a histogram here. So as of today, as of the time I took the screenshot, I'll update it here, not too different, about 70%, 0.7 of the NYSE stocks up on the day, 0.3 or 30% 
down on the day. What's interesting is when the market does one thing, but you don't see it confirmed, that means less stocks are participating. You usually find that at the end of a move. We haven't had that yet. It's been confirming the recent uptrend that we've seen. This is a really interesting chart looking at uh, S&P stocks and New York Stock Exchange stocks making new 52-week highs and lows. And I tend to pay most attention to the one on the bottom. This is saying uh, 81 stocks in the S&P 500 at, at a, as of the screenshot at a new 52-week high. This is as of Thursday and Friday. The current bar is going to update once we're able to take all the stocks and calculate the breadth reading. You'll see the bar, the histogram popped up here. I'm sure this will be a pretty positive reading for today just with the movement in the markets overall. But, you know, seeing the market rally and this increase is really telling you that not only is the market up, but a lot of stocks are participating seeing uh, new highs. So, you know, just under uh, 20 percent of the S&P new highs on Thursday and Friday, which is pretty interesting. I'm then looking at cumulative advancers decliners, which has been very positive. Cumulative new highs and new lows, which has been very positive. Up down versus down volume, cumulative over time. So overall volume on up bars versus down bars, very positive. So all three of those are accumulating those daily readings and advanced decliners and up and down days, up and down volume, and looking at that over time, all three very much in the green. And finally, I look at some of Tom McClellan and his father, Sherman McClellan, uh, their work on uh, oscillators. This incorporates uh, some uh, advanced decliners. You, some of them incorporate volume. Some of them incorporate, uh, they smooth out with exponential moving averages. Overall, the McClellan oscillator is more positive than negative. The summation index, which accumulates that over time, just starting to hook up a little bit. And then finally, the trend index, uh, also called the ARMS index, named after the late Dick ARMS, who's a, a, uh, a famous longtime technical analyst, uh, showing you the short-term accumulation distribution, how that relates to the long-term. A little more negative than positive, but overall uh, holding up pretty well. That is my chart list that I use every week to look through breadth. I know that was a tear through of those. If any of those charts are of interest and you're not sure how to, uh, how to create them, shoot me an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. I'm happy to send you the charts, or I can send you the whole chart list. Happy to do that. You can save it to, uh, to your login. Ladies and gentlemen, we, however, need to move on to our final segment, the three and three. So every show, we finish it off with three charts in three minutes. If these are not on your radar up until this moment, they certainly should be going forward. The first one is looking at the dollar. We didn't talk a lot uh, on this show about sort of intermarket relationships. John Murphy's done such great work uh, looking at that over time. But I think it's really interesting to note that the U.S. dollar uh, ETF, the bullish ETF, which is UUP, is at a really key juncture right here. It is testing its 200-day moving average. It has not been below the 200 days since April of 2018. It's remained above it this entire time. Now testing it has not closed below, but really, really close. Um, and it's also testing support from October, right? So this is the most recent swing low. So all of a sudden, you have a support level that's being tested. You have the 200-day that's being tested. And we have a lower high. If this breaks down through support, down below around 2650 or so, that would complete a transition from more of a bullish phase to a bearish phase. And it's happening right when the RSI is just below 40, which you can see I've indicated how 40 has tended to be support in all of these ways. So we are right at that line in the sand. Do we bounce off of here as normally we have done over the last two years? Or is this a change of character? And if this line keeps going down, watch out for things like EFA and EM, global non-US stocks, which will tend to outperform when the dollar is getting weaker. So one interesting chart to look at. Second one is Dow theory. This is the Dow industrials, the Dow transports. Again, traditionally, it was Charles Dow's way of measuring the overall strength of the economy. Here, the industrials have a lot of financials and tech. Here, transports have things like railroads, but also uh, airlines and other things like that. Starting to improve, it had looked a little negative with some non-confirmation with a higher move here and a lower peak in the transports. But boy, starting to appreciate. So if we get a higher uh, break, a, a break to around 11,000 in the transports, that would sort of reverse that non-confirmation, illustrate the transports are confirming the uptrend. So that's an interesting chart to watch. The final one is the new highs and new lows. I showed this just now talking about my breadth chart list. And this chart in particular is showing you after a time when we've had consistent new highs from the New York Stock Exchange, consistent new highs with the S&P 500, look at how many more we've had, especially on the S&P, relative to the last four or five months. So this is showing you an influx of stocks that are just like the market, sort of at or near new highs, making new 52-week highs. And if that trend continues, that tells you there's a lot of strength going into the, uh, into the end of the year. So overall, boy, it's, it's an interesting market here. A lot of things telling you long and strong with technology, with new highs. Looking at some of the bearish divergences, those are the themes we're going to look at 
going forward. So ladies and gentlemen, that is our show today. I want to thank you so much for watching uh, every day after the close here on Stock Charts TV. Please get us your questions or feedback anytime via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. You can also go to our YouTube channel to see all of our previous shows. For stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night.